we're ready. So welcome to this event. Today is the session two of our uh, webinar titled Electric Vehicle Total Cost of Ownership and Grid Integration Tools, which is a workshop uh, under the GEF funded e-mobility support and investment platform for Central and Eastern Europe, West Asia and Middle East. This event, as you will, will have seen in all of the invitations, is co-hosted by the EBRD, uh, from which we have here today Victor Bonilla to join us and give some opening remarks, and also from our side as the IEA, the International Energy Agency. Before beginning, I would like to give notice that this event, the same as the last session, will be recorded, and both the presentation of today, the slides, and the recording will be available in our website's uh, event page for this specific session. Before we begin, I would like to thank EBRD for the great collaboration. We have been working with Victor uh, for a long time already to make sure this event is as best as possible and useful as possible for all of you attending today. So um, now I will give the floor to Victor Bonilla uh, to give some opening remarks from uh, the EBRD side. Thank you, Javier. Up a second. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, so thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victor Bonilla and I work at the EBRD. Um, thank you very much to the IEA for uh, co-hosting with us this event, which is the second part of a workshop in which we are sharing the work they have done as part of the Global Electric Mobility Program um, for elaborating certain tools related to e-mobility. In the case of today, will be an EV charging and grid integration tool. But before we enter into that, I would like to just introduce very briefly what is this regional investment platform about and the overall global program. So this program is funded by the GEF7, and it's a global electric mobility program um, implemented with several partners. Uh, it's EBRD and the EIA, of course, but there are, there are also several UN agencies like UNEP, um, UNIDO, UNDP, and other partners like the ADB and others. Um, so this program aims at increasing the capacity in the preparation of electric mobility on different parts of the world and also in fostering uh, investment in the sector. Uh, it is composed by two main components. The first component has four working groups elaborating knowledge and tools. Uh, these four working groups cover uh, cars, uh, another one on heavy duty vehicles like buses and trucks, a third on two and three wheelers, and a fourth on um, battery uh, and, EV, and EV grids and, and, and EV charging in general. Um, the second component, uh, it's composed by um, four regional platforms. And these platforms um, cover four continents. So there is one for Asia and the Pacific, another one for Africa, a third for Latin America, and a fourth one covering Eurasia, which is the one being implemented by DBRD, and the official name is um, Regional Support and Investment Platform for Central and Eastern Europe, West Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, this whole program, uh, global program, uh, supports a big number of projects, around 40 to 50 in different parts of the world. And in our case, it supports six national projects in our region, funded by the GEF, plus uh, others that may join in the, in the coming months. Um, among the main outcomes that we expect to achieve with this platform is to develop a community of practice, a network of practitioners in the mobility in the region. We also uh, aim at increasing the capacity for project development and to improve the, the, the ties with EV suppliers in the region. And we also expect that through the platform, there will be conditions created for market expansion and increased investment in the sector. To give a few more details, uh, we have structured the platform across five components a community of practice, as I mentioned, in which we meet from time to time with different with the different project managers to share the experiences in, the, in, in their projects and to understand what are the main challenges that they're being faced. A help desk slash web space in which we share the, the uh, work we are doing and we try to also sort uh, some of the issues that the, the, the projects may be, may be um, um, facing. Then we also have an annual event. Uh, this year it was in Izmir and it was focused on, on trainings and on electric buses. But next year will likely be in March uh, in London and with, in which we try to create some networking. Uh, we do some presentations and probably some technical visits as well. 
The fourth component is probably the most important one, which is about training and capacity building. And um, today's uh, seminar is part of the dissemination activities that uh, we organize, among others, and I will explain those later. And uh, finally, we have a fifth component uh, called a marketplace, and it comes a bit later in the program when the projects have already uh, progressed a bit more. And uh, it consists on supporting them to, to find finance and how to scale up their demonstration projects into a bigger scopes. A bigger scopes. In terms of upcoming events, which this is my last slide, uh, of course we are uh, we have been delivering these uh, workshops with the IEA. Uh, today and also the, the, the first session that happened last week. Uh, I also wanted to mention that we are delivering a set of training in, uh, in electric mobility with interpretation in Russian and Arabic. Um, the first session happened uh, in October, uh, but the second session is in this week, in 16 November, with a focus on uh, EV policy. The third one will be mid-November, mid-December, sorry, probably, on fleet electrification. And there will be three more sessions on EV charging and battery recycling early next year. And finally, I just want to um, remind as well that we will have this annual in-person workshop um, in the first quarter of 2024. I may share more information about that. Uh, and yeah, that's that's more it for, for my side. Thank you very much. If you want to have more information, just drop me an email and I will be happy to, to have a chat with you. Thank you. And with this, I think that it's time to go back to the IEA. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. We're really happy to work with you and collaborate for this event. Now I will uh, give the floor to our colleague, uh, Jack Poirier. Jack is the IES Jeff E-Mobility Working Group Core Coordinator and also is a Power System Transformation Analyst at our unit, which is the Renewable Integration and Secure Electricity Unit. Jack, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Javier. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. It's a pleasure to co-host uh, this event with the EBRD and to see the, the progress of the platform. It's uh, really nice to see that the the platform is taking uh, life and that uh, the, a lot of events are uh, scheduled and uh, are going to take place. Um, I wish also to thank my colleagues, uh, Per Anders Videl and uh, Shane McDonough, who presented during the previous event on Thursday um, about the total cost of ownership tool. And I hope uh, you, will, uh, you were able to join that event too. If not, uh, the recording will be made uh, available online soon. So uh, I just remind about the, the role of the IEA in this global electric mobility uh, program. Uh, we lead the work on uh, two specific working groups. The first one about light duty vehicles. The second one about charging and grid integration. Uh, it is a pleasure to, to be part of uh, this program and to be uh, delivering knowledge products um, and to uh, also uh, uh, track data about countries, policies, and markets. Uh, it is a great value for us to be part of this network because uh, we work uh, with a number of countries uh, around the world, the members of the IEA family, but um, being part of this network allows us also to um, reach beyond those countries. And uh, it has a value for us to work with a number of agencies uh, like the EBRD and all the, the countries from which you, you belong. It's a two-way collaboration. We deliver knowledge products and we share um, this uh, information like uh, doing these uh, events uh, as the one today. Uh, but on, um, in return, we also get a better understanding of the challenges of uh, all the countries beyond those we are used to work with. The work of IEA in electric mobility goes beyond um, looking only at the vehicles and the technology. Indeed, uh, transport electrification will play a major role in uh, the clean energy transitions. And uh, we also look very carefully at the integration of EVs in the electricity system. In our unit, the RISE unit, Renewable Integration Secure Electricity Unit, uh, we are uh, specialized in looking at how to ensure a secure yet affordable and clean electricity supply. And we do analysis on electricity grids, electricity security, and the integration of renewables, as well as new electricity uses like electric vehicles. There are a growing number of studies uh, that look at the potential consequences of, uh, for the power system of uh, the growth of EVs. And uh, I will just give a couple of examples of uh, the United States of America, for example, where EVs are booming. If 
two out of three cars in the USA were electric by 2050. That is more or less 190 million electric vehicles. The peak demand of electricity could grow by as much as 32% compared to business as usual. If we look at the um, distribution system, a service area in California would need to upgrade five times more feeders than they originally planned to accommodate EVs by 2030. So just considering this couple of examples, we see that um, neglecting the electricity grid could be a, a real challenge for uh, the growth of electric mobility. I will just briefly introduce the charging and grid uh, integration tool before handing over to Javier. Uh, he will speak much more in details, but uh, of course we are uh, really um, proud and excited about this tool because uh, when we looked around um, what existed, uh, we found a number of tools, but none of them uh, was actually meeting the needs, especially of uh, um, emerging markets uh, where uh, the availability of data is very limited. So we wanted a tool that allows anyone uh, around the world to assess the uh, simulate and assess actually the consequences of a fleet that would be specific uh, to their own country. So uh, we developed this tool with uh, an intent to be pedagogical, but also uh, with the ability to be used by um, professionals uh, like planners and policy makers uh, in a more advanced modeling world. Um, this tool is actually a companion to a policy manual that we released about grid integration of EVs and that we released last year in December. Uh, it is also available on the IEA website, so feel free to, to download it. Um, I will hand over now uh, back to Javier, who will uh, introduce more in detail the, um, the tool. Uh, and I will also add that uh, you have uh, in the um, Zoom uh, window, you have a Q&A box and you are free to uh, post any question at any time during the presentation so that we can address them uh, afterwards. Thank you very much. And Javier, over to you. Thank you very much, Jack. So, now I will continue with the presentation, but let me also stress what Jack said. We have a Q&A box that you can use to put your questions that we will address at the end of my presentation. But if it happens that you have a very pressing question that you really need to get answered in order to understand the rest of the presentation, then feel free to raise your hand and we will get back to you as soon as we can see. So now I will share my screen and begin with the presentation. Can you see my slide? Perfect. Okay, so as explained today, we will I will be presenting the EV charging and grid integration tool. And just for clarity, when I say EV, I refer to electric vehicles. Uh, and I will show first, uh, talk about a bit about grid integration of EVs and why it's important to talk about this topic and what kind of frameworks we can have uh, to integrate uh, uh, EVs more efficiently to the grid. Then I will go right away into doing a live demo of the EV charging and grid integration tool. But as previously said, it was developed under the collaboration of the IA and the Jeff program. And then at the end, I will have a post a Q&A to answer all of the questions you may have about the tool. So let's begin. First, an important message is that uh, the EV charging demand and faster charging will grow substantially. What we see is that uh, EV charging demand is already substantial today accounting from more or less 110 terawatt hours annually, which is in 2022, the equivalent of the demand of the whole country of the Netherlands. And it, in our scenarios, could grow between 950 terawatt hours or even reach 1700 terawatt hours by 2030. In, in our case, in the scenario, which would, which would be in line with the net zero emissions pathways and the commitments set in the Paris Agreement. So this shows that in an annual basis, the EV charging demand will be growing substantially, and that's one reason why we should care about this stuff. But also a second aspect of why it's important to care about the growth in EV charging demand is not only because it will grow on an annual basis, but also its structure will change. And this is because larger vehicle sizes, for example, uh, buses or trucks, which will require uh, faster charging in many cases because of their larger battery size, will have a bigger uh, role in the system. And therefore, this could put increasing stress on the power systems that we need to address and uh, optimize in order to avoid significant uh, issues for the power systems. So what we see is that in road transport, electrification, we can have several impacts. What are the impacts of EV charging? 
it can have, for example, impacts on depending on three variables. One is uh, the time, meaning when and also for how long the charging takes place. The second one is the location. Uh, the location, for example, is if it's in a small distribution grid, if it's in a highway, it's, if it's in a residential area, for example, all of this will impact uh, how much of an effect the EV charging of that particular vehicle or vehicle fleet will have on the system. Uh, and third, also the charging capacity, namely how much power that charging is drawing from the system. All of the, these three aspects will have a very important, um, a big importance on the definition on, to understand how much impact we will see from the EV charging of several different fleets. So based on that, we can see different impacts. For example, we could see low impacts, uh, such as in work-based charging. Uh, this is because that, that can take place over a longer period of time, which means that to get the same amount of energy, the vehicles can be charged with less power. However, it, in contrast, we, for example, we think of en route charging, for example, in a highway, normally the drivers would like to stop the, as little time as possible. That means they would prefer to use a higher charging power and this could have higher impacts on the grid. At the same time, we can also think of going from challenges to opportunities. And these opportunities are unlocked by smart charging. For example, taking into account that the long time of the charging windows, meaning how much time the vehicle is stationed there and able to be charged, we could have the highest opportunities, for example, in work-based charging or home-based charging. This is because the vehicles are stationed for a long time, and this means that if the technology is available, uh, the charging can be rearranged uh, to ensure that the energy required is met on time, but it, it, the charging uh, can, can be distributed along the time to when it's most beneficial to the power system. Therefore, the home charging, for example, and work-based charging can have larger opportunities in terms of flexibility and manageability of the charging than for example, in Android charging, which, as I was saying before, drivers normally tend to arrive and want to leave as soon as possible. Going uh, further into flexibility, what we see is that charging flexibility is really essential and needed to lower system costs and emission. For example, what we see is that flexible demand uh, in terms of EV charging can uh, mean a system cost savings, for example, in terms of peak uh, uh, power system costs, also average operational costs, and also therefore emissions. This is because if we have the ability to shift the demand, for example, what we see here on the left, uh, to where um, the renewables are mostly available, which are cheaper and also they uh, are low emission sources of electricity, that can mean that we can both avoid emissions, but also avoid operational costs if we have the proper technologies in place to enable that smarter charging or what we call managed charging. Now, I would like to give a few examples and some ideas out of our uh, policy manual that Jack already mentioned, which is the policy manual for grid integration of electric vehicles. And my key message here is that effective and coordinated action is really essential to integrate EV successfully at scale. This is not only a matter for policymakers, of course, because all of the stakeholders of uh, electric transport can be involved. This includes, for example, Pilot project developers, industry leaders, uh, academics, all of the stakeholders will be and their participation will be essential to ensure an efficient integration of EVs. So what we see is mainly four key steps for policymakers to successfully integrate EVs. The first one uh, is to prepare institutions for the electric mobility tra uh, transition. This is uh, policymakers should engage with the electric mobility stakeholders, as I was saying, not only, for example, we as with the Ministry of Energy of each country, but also include in the discussions the industry associations, for example, uh, uh, pilot project developers, and so on and so on. And this is important to get the most insights possible to plan for the best uh, transition. But not only is it important to engage with them bilaterally, but also to break silos in planning and policy making. For example, building joint offices of energy and transportation, such as what, what happens in the US. Second, what we recommend is to assess the power system impacts. Then a very important step would be to define an electric mobility strategy, for example, defining certain goals and understanding how the electric mobility transition could evolve over the years. For example, to understand if in a certain country there could be a larger fleet of trucks, of buses, or for example, two wheelers. That is, of course, depends on the country. 
And then some very important steps include to gather data and develop insights. Uh, and then with all of those insights to assess the grid impacts on the mobility scenarios to prepare uh, and upgrade the, the grids and the power systems whenever it's necessary. The third aspect is directly going into deploying measures for grid integration. This includes, for example, that all charging solutions could be accommodated, but we encourage, if possible, to uh, uh, have smart or what we call managed charging in place. The second aspect would be to facilitate aggregation by enforcing standards on interoperability. The third one would be to find ways to value the flexibility of EVs, for example, to through time of use types or other market mechanisms to ensure that the flexibility provided by EV charging is uh, incentivized in the market schemes or in some way. The fourth one would be to coordinate EV charging with renewables. And then the fifth one would be to incentivize smart readiness, meaning that the technologies that are deployed for EV charging infrastructure ideally should have smart technologies already uh, available, for example, communication protocols. The last step would be to improve planning practices. And this refers to in conducting proactive grid planning to really prepare and try to upgrade uh, the grids whenever needed, trying to anticipate uh, when the needs will arise and also to fully reflect the full value of EV charging. For example, considering what benefits uh, flexible charging can um, bring to the system when planning the, the power system as most countries normally do uh, year and year. I will now go into two examples and then I, I will go right away to the two. So to assess the power system impacts, our key recommendations are first to develop mobility scenarios, as I was saying before. So. One example of this is what the transmission system operator at Clay of France is doing, uh, but also, for example, in the case of the US, what the National Laboratory, Laboratory NREL is doing in terms of developing scenarios to understand how electric mobility could evolve. Second one is to develop travel service to understand the traveling patterns, uh, and also by vehicle, for example, to understand where vehicles drive and at what times of the day and for how long. This is done by uh, for example, doing travel surveys such as done in Chile and Thailand, and also, for example, what is being developed in terms of EV charging patterns in, in the case of France. The third one would be to deploy digital technologies. Uh, for example, that's the case of what they're doing uh, for GPS systems in light duty vehicles uh, and in trucks in, in many places, for example, in the US and in Europe. And the last step, what we recommend, for example, is to get more data and that way develop more insights that can be in useful for the planning. Uh, ideally, to, to record charging sessions and make those that data open access, for example, uh, what is being done in Germany uh, uh, in a public tender that was uh, developed recently. Now I will focus on some measures that we see for uh, grid integration. So based on that, what we uh, have is a framework that we developed for this report called Grid Integration of Electric Vehicles that is not meant to be a step-by-step -step, step guide that is mandatory to follow, but more so as a reference to guide policymakers, uh, depending on what level of the development the electric mobility transition has in their country. So for example, we have this uh, ordered in four phases. Phase one would be if the country is not seeing any noticeable impact of electric mobility in their power system, and there, what we would recommend, uh, for example, would be to encourage higher electric vehicle uptake through incentives and also by developing public uh, EV charging infrastructure. This is the case of most countries today. Now, a second phase would be when the electric vehicle charging demand begins to be noticeable, but at the same time, the power system overall doesn't have a big uh, need for uh, flexibility. Uh, for example, this would be the case of Norway, that, that despite Norway having a high uptake of electric vehicles, the fact that they have a, also a lot of hydropower, which is flexible in, in its operation, means that there is not that extra uh, flexibility gap to meet, and thus this country would be allocated in this phase of our framework. And in this case, what we would recommend is to begin looking at uh, measures that are what we call passive, for example, time of use tariffs that uh, normally have different prices of electricity throughout the day to encourage uh, changes in behavior of the charging of the users. Uh, and that is one example of a measure that can be useful in this uh, phase uh, of the country. A third one would be when flexible electric load is 
significant, meaning that there is some flexibility already on the EV charging side. And at the same time, the system needs uh, more and more flexibility uh, to be provided. So this can be the case, for example, of France, Netherlands, and the US. And in this case, we would also recommend to look into uh, some other measures that we call active, for example, unidirectional vehicle to grid, which means that in this case, there is the ability of the system to control the charging of the vehicles uh, directly, instead of the case of the time of use tariffs, where it's more of an incentive to, to modify the charging based on the user's preferences. And then the last one will be a case in which both a flexible load is highly available, meaning the, the AP charging demand because of the technologies in place and the participation of the public is quite uh, flexible in its, uh, in its behavior. And at the same time, the system needs a high amount of flexibility to ensure uh, to meet the demand at all time. So this, for example, is what we see in some island power systems. So for example, in the case of the Azores Islands in Portugal and in Hawaii. And in those cases, there are already some uh, active measures deployed as pilots. For example, what we call B2G. B2G in this case would be bidirectional, meaning that not only the, there is infrastructure for the grid to control the charging, but at the same time, the, whenever it's needed, the electric vehicle can provide back power to the system, thus providing even more uh, benefits to the power system than in previous cases. So with that, I finished my introduction and I, I will go to the tool. I will leave here the QR code a bit in case you want to go right away and open the tool and follow what I am doing in my presentation. Yeah, and also Jason kindly left the, the link to the tool in the chat, so you can also use that to access it. All right, let's go into the, the tool. So the tool here has three main motivations, and for those motivations, three aspects of the tool were developed. The first one is, as she has previously said, to assess the impact of EV charging on the power system. The second one is more specifically assess the effect of measures for mitigating, mitigating EV charging impacts. I already discussed some of those measures, for example, time of use tariffs and uh, unidirectional uh, charging, which is B1G. And the third motivation of the tool is uh, not only to assess the effects of the measures uh, of the charging in terms of demand for the system, we would also like to estimate what are the CO2 emissions directly because of EV charging. And of course, this will depend directly on the power system uh, that we are uh, modeling. So for the first motivation, we developed the model uh, of simulating the EV charging behavior, which output is a weekly EV charging demand profile. The second one, follows the same logic. So it's also the weekly EV charging demand profile, but in this case, it's a variation that has some managed or what we would call smart charging measures in place. And then the third model would be based on a simplified representation of the electricity mix, meaning without complex modeling of the grid, just a simplified representation uh, of the electricity mix, the tool gives as an output the calculation of the weekly and also annual CO2 emissions for the user to compare different measures and assess their impacts, not only in terms of demand, but also in terms of emissions. So let me first show you what the tool can do, and I will then show you how to get there uh, to this result set. So the main output, as I was saying of the tool, is a weekly demand profile on a five minute uh, resolution basis. So what you can get with this tool is a simulation of the EV charging demand based on either one single fleet or even up to 10 different fleets that you can define. And with that, you can assess the results of the EV charging profiles and the emissions profiles, both by fleet, meaning that you can overlap the different fleets and see what impact each of the fleets has at every moment of the week, but also by charging location. This means, for example, what's the charging profile in over a week of an en route charging or uh, what uh, will have as workplace charging, or for example, what we call home charging or depot charging. And depot would be wherever the, for example, the buses or the trucks are stored. So with this, um, this is a very useful uh, output because it can, it can be used for a variety of ways. For example, you could export 
this demand curve for a planning exercise, if you're doing a power system modeling, for example, like capacity expansion planning, if you are, let's say, a pilot project developer, and you would need to know, for example, if you would like to test 10 or 100 buses in a pilot, uh, you can get, make a first assessment of what could be the transformer needs, meaning based on the peak demand simulated, what, how much uh, grid capacity you would need for your project. And also it can be useful to simulate different policies. Uh, for example, if we simulate different types of use tariffs uh, and tariff design, we could see what impacts this has on the grid and, and on, on the charging profile. So as I'm explaining, this can have uh, utility for a variety of stakeholders. Um, and that was our main aim when develop developing this. So I will, I'll go to my first example. So this is a tool. Uh, and just before going to the tabs, I will show a bit what we have here. So first, here's a, an explanation of the tool. And here, I will not show it at the moment, but you can check later that there is a technical note and a guide to using the tool that has a lot of detail explaining what are some of the assumptions behind, how does the modeling work, and some example cases that you can uh, do with this tool. And then going to, to the tool right away, what we see are several tabs. The first one is where you define the fleet. So what you have here first is a label that you can modify. For example, if I want to do buses, I can just write buses, but you can name this as whatever, however you want. Then you can select the vehicle type. This is done, for example, in, in this part where you can select two wheelers, three wheelers, LDVs, with, which would be light duty vehicles or in a simpler way, cars and vans, a bus or a truck. And then you can select for the, the type of vehicle on the left, what the stock is, meaning how much, how many vehicles of that type do you want to simulate? Then the tool also for the fleet definition has some predefined um, technical characteristics that you can modify. For example, the average battery capacity, how much energy it consumes per kilometer, and also some different uh, behavioral patterns. For example, the average weekday driving and the weekend driving. And this is different because in many of these cases, the driving behavior changes between the week and the weekend. Lastly, you can define here uh, what behavior profile you, want, profile you want to have. For example, if it's a car, normally we would select uh, private driving, but if we have a, a fleet, then normally we would select a fleet-based driving uh, to reflect better the characteristics of that, uh, that fleet. And then here, you can add uh, one more segment and you can uh, in total have up to 12 different segments uh, where you can modify the characteristics of the size of the fleet, but also uh, this behavioral or technical characteristics that I was showing before. So let's do an example on 100 buses, just for illustration. So as you see here, this already changed automatically. So going to the default values, but you can modify this however you wish. So having already defined the fleet, I will go to show what is here in the behavior profile stack. So here you can def define different behavior profiles for all the different fleets you define. So here, the segment we have is buses. So it's the only one because we only have defined one segment in the fleet tab. And here you will begin to see a lot of different options, each of which has a question mark here in case you want to read a bit more about what that means. So basically what we have here at first is the charging availability. What this means is that, um, by each location, meaning Home Depot, workplace, roadside charging, destination, and en route. You have different technical characteristics, for example, the charging power. And the availability here uh, will depend both on the availability of infrastructure, meaning if there exists uh, any type of, uh, for example, home charging in the area that we are modeling, but also what level of access do the drivers of this fleet have? So for example, uh, what we could think is that uh, on the workplace, uh, normally in the, the case of the, the people that go to the work, um, there is a, let's say 60% of people uh, that have access to a workplace uh, charging uh, during the week, but because they don't go normally to the weekends on, on, to, to the office, then the weekend availability of that same type of infrastructure is lower because of that access. Thing. So it's not only a matter of if the charging infrastructure exists, but also how or what share of the people or the drivers of that specific fleet 
have access actually on the week or on the weekend that level of uh, to that uh, infrastructure. I will just leave this as default. And then here we have all other parameters. For example, you have to here select some preference and you can modify the preference. For example, if you want to simulate what happens if the drivers uh, in some location, for example, they, they prefer to charge more at work, more in highways, for example, en route, or more simply in their home depot. By default, in the case of buses, 95% of preference goes to Home Depot, but this could be modified as you wish, for example, uh, for the case of buses, but also for other types of vehicles, such as uh, cars uh, and trucks. And then here, what we, ha what we have is you can select different uh, options uh, uh, in terms of behavior uh, with regards to the arrival and, and staying times. So for example, normally, what we have by default here is that buses tend to arrive at, uh, at 8 p.m. and tend to stay for 12 hours. Uh, but of course, you can change this however you, you, you wish, to try to reflect better the arrival times and stay times of the vehicles in your own specific context. So now let's go to the results. So as I was saying here, you have the first tab. This is what you can see, for example, if you select just one simple um, feed, as, as I did before. So this, for example, allows you several things. You can check the maximum EV power demand over the week, which the highest point is almost 1,700 kilowatts. Then you also have an indicator here of the average EV power demand over the week. And you also have calculations of the energy consumption over the week and an estimation based on the weekly value of the annual uh, EV charging demand because of this fleet you define. So here, you have here the option to see all of this by, on the, uh, on, on the chart itself, and it's an interactive chart. But you can also download this if you want to process the data, uh, for example, or if you want to load this data to another tool, for example, for simulating the power system or other kind of simulation, you can download all of these results as CSV files here uh, below. So this would be the example here of or the, the case of the buses, where we see that, uh, for example, the, the peak charging would be happening at midnight, which is usually when the buses are stationed in their depot uh, before they most of them go out on the next day to continue driving. Now I'll continue uh, and I will do some comparisons based on some an example with cars. So for that, I will do a clean start of the tool just to show you again in practice how this can be used to, to modify whatever you want and simulate what you want to simulate. So as I was saying, I will do an example with cars. I will then go to LDVs, which as I was saying is stands for cars and vans. So this is the closest one to cars. I will use that. I will keep the stock at 1000 and I will show you uh, now the results in terms of uh, the car drive. So in this case, as, as you see, uh, normally because the profiles of the cars are defined in such a way that reflecting the real life situations, normally people, uh, arrive to their homes around 6 or 7 p.m. And normally, uh, without any managed charging measures in place, that is when they connect the vehicle to charge. So what we see here is normally peaks around that time, peaks around 7, 7 and a half or 7 p.m. Um, and this is following, as I was saying, the behavior that uh, we think by default is what happens in, uh, with the car fleets of private drivers. So with this, you can assess uh, in the total demand by the whole segment. Uh, but also you can check it by location. This is also something that could be interesting. Let's check out these results. For example, here, as I was saying, uh, maybe it's even easier to see here, the, the light blue color reflects the home charging. So this means drivers connect and the big demand because of the car fleet is seen whenever the drivers come back to their house. Uh, but also there is some level of workplace charging, uh, which is here the dark blue one. This is because also in this simulation, the car drivers have some level of availability of uh, charging in their workplace. And thus, some of the charging needs uh, in this case of the fleet are met directly in the workplace. And that also decreases a bit the, let's say the pressure uh, on the home charging in the late afternoon or evening. So here, as, I, as I'm showing, you can here by selecting my location, you can check similar indicators here on the top, but in the chart itself, you can see different uh, location uh, values and the charging profiles that 
they are observing by each different location. Now, a different example I will show is just to simulate some of these variations in the scenarios or, or the cases that we are modeling. What happens if, because of any reason, for example, because of a subsidy or an incentive by a government, uh, what happens if there is a strong incentive towards work-based charging to try to, for example, is have more synergies with the solar PV availability during the day. So with that, I will go again to refresh the tool. I will quickly put this as cars. And then to modify the availability uh, uh, between home charging and workplace charging, I have to go here to the behavior profile stack, as I was saying before. So for example, here, I can put this to 25% just as an illustration, and then increase this both to 70%. And here, when going to the results tab, you will see a strong shift to the case of workplace charging. So as you see here, before the strongest peak, uh, because of higher availability, uh, and also the preference of car drivers was in the evening in terms of home charging, but now because we modified the availability of the workplace charging, then what we have is a stronger peak in the workplace charging that happens also in the early morning. And thus, we can also find ways to reduce uh, the weekly profile um, and the impacts of the grid uh, of the um, charging. If we have options to shift the charging in terms of location from more uh, home-based charging to now more workplace charging. Now, one last example I will show you before going to a different part of the, of the presentation is what happens if we simulate more than one fit. So I will just replicate now what we had before for cars, but now I will add a second fit, which in this case will be buses. So going back to my first example here, 100 buses, and I will set this at fleet driving. And based on that, you will see here the combined results. And now that I have actually more than one fleet, I can show you that in this tab called by segment, you can see both the demand curve uh, by bus or by cars here light blue. And you can even check them separately if you would like, if you prefer uh, just a line chart instead of a stack area chart, which is here. Okay. Now, uh, just a second. Okay. Now we'll go to explain a bit the different modules, which is a mo mo motivation behind implementing smarter or managed charging. So this is basically directly dependent on the flexibility available that will enable a uh, flexible charging. So this is. Uh, for example, the, the tool, what it does is that it checks the flexibility availability, which is, means that it checks if in the charging window that we have, meaning the state time that the tool has, that, that, the, that the simulation has, is it possible to shift some of that charging to a different place uh, for, in time, for example, or also to modulate a bit the charging power in order to decrease the impact to the system. Then if there is some margin, what we call here flexibility in that charging window, the question the tool asks itself is about the participation rate. Is the public available to participate and also is the infrastructure adapted? If that answer is yes, at least to a certain share of the fleet, then the tool applies a managed charging measure. This can be, uh, for example, what we call balanced charging. In this case, just to make the contrast, what we call unmanaged is basically just the driver arriving to the charging spot connecting and the charger in the unmatched case would be at full power until the battery is completely full and then it would stop. Even if it had more time to charge, it would charge at full power. Instead, what we call the balanced charging or in more generally a managed way of charging is that uh, the charging can use all of that time window in order to shift the charging, for example, maybe to stop charging in some moments, but then charge again or uh, in the case of balanced charging, to charge on an average lower power, 
but for longer time, and thus ensuring that the same energy is provided, but as the power, uh, namely in kilowatts, for example, is lower, that has a lower impact on the grid. And then some other uh, examples of um, uh, managed charging include uh, time of use tariffs, as I was saying, but in the case of D1G, it's the same logic. So for example, we have a reference profile. In the case of time of use tariffs, it's a reference price that changes over the day, and thus it can influence when the vehicles charge. But at the same time, in the case of D1G or unidirectional active uh, charging, this means that uh, it's a signal that uh, points to the current power system demand. So it will mean that in the case of B1G, the charging will try to take place whenever the system demand is lowest in order to arrive the total demand, meaning system-based demand plus EV demand to be the minimal as possible at every time. So now I will show first the uh, case of balanced charging. So let's go now to the example of cars. I will, repeat it. I will do it again, just for again showing how this works. And then if we want to apply these measures, then we have to go to the advanced options tab. So here we left all of that, other, those other parameters by default. And here we can select by every fleet. In this case, we'll select it for the fleet for cars. What charging strategy they have. So in this case, I mentioned balanced. So I will use the balanced strategy in this one. So in this case, let's look at the results. So here, what you see is that for that fleet of 1,000 cars, we have a maximum EV power demand of around 500 kilowatts. And the peak, eh, even though it's larger than the lower levels of the week eh, during the, the, the middle of the day, is a lot less pronounced than if we have unmanaged charging. This is because with this strategy, eh, the system tries to take advantage of the long stay times of the vehicles eh, after arriving from work until leaving the, the house in the next morning. And that allows the system to see less impacts because there is a lower average uh, and also a lower peak uh, demand in terms of charging power uh, than in the unmanaged case. And just to show that, remember that here in the balanced case, we had around 500 kilowatts, but in the case of unmanaged, we'll have a higher peak. So as you see here, the unmanaged case, which is basically, as I was saying before, drivers just arriving, connecting the charger, charging at full power until the battery is full. This leads itself to a higher peak. And therefore, in this case, we would see that the balanced charging could be an effective way to decrease the impact of the system. Now, let me go to a, a, another example, which is, as I was saying before, the time of, time of use tariff. So, in this same tab that is called advanced options, then we can go here below and we actually can modify, you have a default value, but you can modify the daily tariff schedule that we have implemented. So as you can see here, the tariff is at, it, at, at its lowest between uh, 11 p.m. and until more or less 8, 9 p.m. and then it begins to increase and reaches its highest point in the evening, which is normally when the power system demand peak happens. So let's have a look at how this impacts the charging of the cars. Okay, so this is also an interesting example and also illustrates why it's important to take into account unexpected secondary effects when designing policies, or in this case, the tariffs. What this shows is that with the tariff scheme that we set, which was a a higher tariff in the evening, and then a strong decrease right away at around 11 p.m. or midnight is that in this case, most of the drivers would be connecting their uh, electric vehicle right when the price drops significantly. This would be at midnight. So what this can cause is actually, depending on the fleet size in some power systems, it could cause a secondary peak in the power system demand. And this could be in many cases, not something that the power system operators would wish because, for example, if the country has a lot of solar PV resource at midnight, that's not available. So that wouldn't be something ideal for the system to deal with. And therefore, it's really important to, when designing such tariffs, to take into account and try to do some simulations to understand what possible unintended consequences 
the tariffs could have in the charging uh, behavior of the uh, drivers, in this case, cars. So now I will go to the V1G example. As I was saying, V1G is a case in which the infrastructure is in place to allow automatic control of the charging, meaning that in time of use tariffs, it's normally based on a decision that the driver takes. But in this case, uh, if the, the, the customer is already participating in the V1G scheme, then there is automatic control happening uh, in order to minimize the impacts on the grid. So here, what we have for the active control with unidirectional charging is basically the input, as I was saying before, is a reference a curve that, as opposed to the time of use tariffs, that is based on a reference price. In the case of V1G, is based on reference demand. Because as I was saying, the idea of V1G is to minimize the total demand, which is equal to EV charging demand plus all of the rest of the sources of demand of the power system. So in this case, we can go to the power grid uh, tab. And here we can go to a bit below where we see the reference curve. What we see here, for example, is that uh, the demand normally tends to peak around 6, 7 p.m. every day in weekdays, and that the demand is at its lowest point in the weekend, which is normally the case in most power systems. So just to illustrate what, what happens and, and just to show you that, that this V1G scheme is working in the tool, I will do some modification here to make sure that the demand is at, at, at its lowest point on the weekend. Okay, so it's very slow. Okay, yeah, so I'll go now to the results. So as you see here, I just artificially created a, an incentive for the charging to take place uh, in an, a higher share in the weekend. So as you see here, the charging over the week tends to be normally stable with some changes there here and there. But as I artificially just to add some illustrative example for this presentation, put the demand as, at its lowest point over the weekend, then what we see is that that influences the charging to be highest in the weekend. This is because, as I was saying, the V1G algorithm tries to minimize the total demand, with total demand being uh, EV charging demand plus the base system demand. So as I put the system demand in a lowest point over the weekend, then the EV charging will try to uh, be shifted to be uh, done whenever the system demand is at its lowest point, which in this case, as I artificially created that, would be over the weekend. Okay. Okay, so those were some examples of the advanced measures of the tool. Uh, and now I will go back to the presentation to explain a bit how the last part works, which is the CO2 emissions uh, due to EV charge. So the way this works is, the, how do we estimate the emissions that are directly because of EV charge? First, what we calculate is a net curve, meaning that we, we, for the total demand that we simulate, we subtract the, for example, wind and solar PV uh, in order to get what is the residual demand that has to be met with thermal power plants. Um, so we calculate that net load curve without and also with EV charging. And this is done in order to have a comparison of uh, the demand that the thermal power plants would need to meet uh, with or without EV charging. Then what we do is that with those two different net load curves, the, the tool simulates uh, uh, an operation of the power system. As I was saying at the beginning, it's a simplified version based on the simplified power mix. So there is no detailed grid modeling or other more advanced constraints. It's just a simplified uh, dispatch simulation. So with that, there is an operational schedule for the plants, meaning which plant uh, is, is running, uh, so how much does it emit, uh, and what's uh, based on the minimum price for emitting the demand. And then 
by knowing that operational schedule of the plants that were run to meet the net load without and also with the EV charging, uh, the emissions can be calculated for both cases from the emissions factors of those power plants. And thus, by having the CO2 emissions with EV charging and without, we can estimate directly the EV charging rated emissions by comparing those and specifically by subtracting the emissions with charging to the emissions without. With this method, what we can do is we can have an approximation to have a, an idea of which emissions are directly caused in the power system, specifically because of the EV charging and that way, uh, we can have an idea, for example, by, as I was saying before, by comparing different measures, how all of these measures are affecting the emissions of the generation because of EV charging. Um, and this can be useful to compare different policies and also scenarios uh, on various aspects, such as uh, uh, policies such as a time of use or other things. So now I will show the same example before, but I will show how this works. So again, I will create a, a blank uh, version. I will go uh, label it again as cars. I will keep the stock in 1000. And here, just to show you, um, here you can also define your power system. So this is basically uh, similar to B1G. If you want to have a specific modeling, you should input here your demand curve of the power system. And here we have already some plants in place by default, but you can also modify uh, this generation capacity um, based basically, for example, modifying the prices for generation, the emissions factors, and the install capacity to better reflect what you have in your own jurisdiction or in your area of modeling of choice. So for example, here in this test, and like default power system we have, just to simulate the electricity mix, we have some plants on coal, uh, some plants of oil, which is less capacity than coal in this case, some gas capacity here, some solar PV, some wind on shore, and some hydro. But here you can also add new sources or you can also delete some of this or modify uh, depending on how you would prefer to uh, simulate your power system, which of course would depend on the availability of generation capacity and the prices of uh, those generation um, assets, um, which depend on your specific context. So here in the power grid tab, you would modify the generation capacity if you would need to modify that. You can also modify the uh, the EV curve, the, sorry, the demand curve uh, that is without EV charging. And you can either do it here, for example, um, and also you can upload a CSV file if you so prefer. So with that here, just before uh, going to the um, other tool, so, sorry, to the other tab, here we have a simulation and here you, you can actually see how that uh, power system the dispatch is, is running. So for example, here we have during the day, we have uh, some uh, contribution of solar PV as expected. So you can, for example, press all of this. If you want to single out one of these uh, generation sources, you can check actually the profile of solar PV. And, and you can also deselect or select to show or omit some of the other aspects to in order to have an idea of how this uh, hourly simulation is uh, running. And also with that way, have an idea of uh, how the power system is operating. Okay, so with that, uh, as I was saying, here you can modify the electricity mix basically to, to get and also the demand to have a, as an input for your power system definition. And with that, uh, you can calculate and see the emissions here. So in this case, based on the algorithm I explained and also on the default electricity mix and demand that I showed, this is the profile and also at the five minute uh, interval resolution showing what would be the emissions with um, and, uh, because directly of, of EVs. So here we have indicators such as the weekly marginal EV emissions, the annual, which is an extrapolation, and then what's the EV share of total emissions. And here uh, you can also show the uh, also the non-EV emissions, which in this case are much bigger than the um, uh, emissions because of EVs. And thus, if we also include it, it's not shown. But of course, this would depend um, on, the, on the simulation of the system and also on the size of the fleets and the characteristics of those fleets. So with that, 
um, I will go back to give some closing remarks on my presentation, and then I will uh, be happy to take questions that you may have. So as shown today, the electrification of road transport, as I showed in my first slide of the presentation, is ongoing, and it will accelerate as, it's, as it contributes to decarbonization and helps to reduce dependency on fossil fuels. Electrification will contribute to a growth in electricity demand, but at the same time, it is an opportunity for the power system as the new uh, end uses of electricity, such as transport, can have some embedded flexibility, as, as we discussed today in the presentation. The power sector can accommodate a wide range of charging solutions, but as, I, as we were saying in the grid integration manual, encouraging a smarter, or what we call managed charging, can bring gains in terms of avoiding peak and also general operational costs and also emissions. And also, if it's possible to uh, allocate that demand uh, when it's uh, more linked to renewable output, it can support faster growth of renewables such as wind and solar PV. What we also see is that we believe the flexibility of new electricity and uses, such as in this case transport, needs to be supported and incentivized early on. Uh, and lastly, what we would like to remark is that our EV charging and grid integration tool, as I showed today with various examples, can be very useful for a wide range of users. For example, pilot developers who would like to assess the grid uh, capacity needs, policymakers who would like to see what impacts a large fleet or a medium fleet would have in their system, or also compare different uh, policy outcomes, for example, and also see some operators in their planning exercises, and also including utilities and academics who may do different types of studies. So with that, I thank you again uh, for your attention, and I will open the floor for questions in the Q&A and answer them as soon as uh, we can. Yeah, there, there is no question yet in the um, in the text box. I hope uh, our audience will start uh, asking questions. But I can start with one question for you. Sure. Um, let's assume I am a planner from a city or from a distribution system operator. Um, your tool allows me to uh, look at a fleet in its globality, uh, but uh, cars go from city to city. And um, actually, the boundaries of my responsibility might be limited. So how do I do that if I am specifically looking at the impact of uh, EV charging on my own city or on my own grid? Uh, can I do that with your tool? Thank you for the question. Yeah, so what you can do is basically, uh, and I will go again to the tool to, to explain a bit my, my thinking here. Uh, wait. So basically, the, the way to, to make this flexible in terms of the jurisdiction or area that you're modeling is inputting the proper parameters. For example, in terms of fleet, or also if you want to simulate the power system in terms of the power system capacity and demand. So for example, if you were to model the whole country, and let's say you know that in the country either today or you expect in, in tomorrow at some point uh, to have, let's say, 100,000 or 10,000 cars, then you can also, for the whole uh, country, you can input that and also input the corresponding capacity of the power system at the national level. But uh, if you want to model uh, just a single city or an area, then you would need to take the parameters and the values that correspond directly to that area. For example, you would need to know how many cars you expect to have or you have today in your city. You need to know and input the proper value for demand in that city. Um, and also, if you want, um, you can, as, as an approximation, input the generation capacity values of all of the plants that are connected to near that substation of the city. So with that, um, you can have a, an approximation of what the impacts could be in your specific city instead of the total uh, country. You can also even take this further down, and you can also think not of a city, but like of a distribution area, let's say a residential neighborhood. So for that, you would need to know how many cars are there. Uh, you would need to know, for example, if they have in that area workplace charging or not. If there's no offices, then probably not. So those are the, the, the ways in which you could adapt these to different uh, sized areas in order to model them uh, as best as possible. I see a question from Victor. 
Yeah, thank you, Javier. Just to follow up on, on these issues that um, uh, Jacques introduced. So uh, first, at national level, is there a limit about the number of vehicles that you can introduce into the model? Because I understand that you can have different segments, so you could model the whole fleet of the country. And I just understand if we are we talking, if there's a limit on the device, you know, you, due to the capacity of the um, software or whatever, uh, just to understand if there is a million, a hundred thousand, and, and if it can help you to model the whole electrification of a fleet. Thank you. Yeah, well, th there is no hard set limit, however, because it, it's a web-based tool. There is some limit that we have found in practice that we are uh, working to try to address in, in the future. So I think that limit uh, is set up more or less around 100,000 vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, more or less. So there, what happens is that because it's a web-based tool, even if you have a very strong computer, a very powerful computer, then the browsers are normally designed to cap the resources mm -hmm. to a certain limit. So what, what you can do there is, for example, try to go for a smaller uh, fit size, uh, and ba based on that, try to extrapolate a bit the results. Mm -hmm. uh, Ideally, you would have the proper fit size, but as, as I was saying, based on this uh, programming solution where, where the issue we are facing at the moment, mm -hmm. um, that's what we would recommend if you were to model a very large uh, sample of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of things. Okay, so um, follow up with this. Now, let's take the example of a bus company that okay. is, uh, has a project to electrify their fleet, the bus fleet, so they, he wants to design a new depot and to understand the, the charging profile. One, uh, it, this comes from a real example of a project where we did in, in, in one country in Central Asia. So uh, just to understand the limit of the, the tool, um, we, you don't, uh, do you have ways to input a maximum um, supply that comes from the capacity of the transformer in that area, you know, that is covering? So, because I would like to know if it is possible to impose a maximum um, power supply and then adapt this manage and manage profiles of the of the charging strategy to that. Would that be possible, or how, how would you try to address this this thing? It's a it's a very good point. At the moment, the tool only models demand, so it's mm -hmm. not considering any type of grid constraint. Uh, mm -hmm. At least if, if you model the simplified. Uh, of course, like in in some cases, you could the, the tool. If, for example, there's not enough capacity because of, for example, not enough available charging infrastructure, in some cases, the tool will show you a percentage of unmet demand. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could uh, use this to check, for example, if it could be your case. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I would recommend, as we, you cannot pre-select a cap uh, on the demand, you can just simulate various scenarios and see what's the peak demand. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. way you can already have an idea, even though you cannot uh, model before like as an input the limit by simulating these scenarios and inputting correctly the fleet size you want to have you can already have an idea of what's a peak uh, you could see in a week and with that decide for example if you would need to in any case uh, implement a time of use tariff or a different scheme or just to maybe reduce the fleet size or you simply go for a higher uh, transformer size mm -hmm. because another, one of the thoughts that we had at the moment as well is that if we can have the peak demand of the different strategies from the tool, for instance, you can cross check that with the capacity of the local, you know, substation or transformer that can be done. And then you could reassess even if it's worth it to uh, upgrade the transformer, or if you could try instead to invest on solar PV or a, like a, a local supply of gener of um, electricity that will um, decrease the needs on the local transformer. And then, you know, that's an alternative. So I think, and you could, with that information, you could also estimate the profile of emissions with the tool, right? If you have yes. the... Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, also, one thing we're working on is because we only have a default profile of uh, solar PV and wind, mm -hmm. we're also working at some point, hopefully in the, soon in the future, to mm -hmm. deploy the, the ability for the user to modify those profiles mm -hmm. uh, to better reflect their local conditions. Uh, because, of course, there are some countries that have excellent solar resources and some that have less excellent solar resources, but also have wind. So it depends a bit. So mm -hmm. um, as you saw before, I showed that you can defend the capacity and uh, mm -hmm. for all of the types of plants. But we're trying to to, uh, to hopefully soon develop uh, the ability for the user to modify the generation profiles of mm -hmm. variable renewables as well. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing you can uh, we're working on.
And final question about the use of the tool. Uh, when you develop all these segments and these profiles, you have to extract the results in, the, in that same session, right? There's not way to like save the profile or save the the the, um, the whole system that you have developed. It's uh, for each session you have to download the results uh, uh, if you want to then use them uh, afterwards. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Based no, on the current implementation, yeah, you have to every time you open or you refresh the the, mm -hmm. the web page. Then you have to input all of the parameters accordingly, and then you mm -hmm. can download the uh, download the, the results. As I was saying, you can download the results in terms of location, in terms of segment, if you have more than one segment, and also in terms of emissions. No, that makes sense for a web-based tool. So thank you. Okay. So do we have any more questions? Um, okay, I don't see any more questions. Is there any more questions here from my audience? Thanks, Javier, and uh, thanks, uh, Victor, for the very interesting question. So. Javier, this tool is designed to give you the possibility to assess the impacts of, um, so to visualize the um, um, the charging load curve um, of a fleet. So um, piggybacking on the question of Victor, um, so how, what is actually the, the thought process that a user should have if he wants to understand the impact on the grid? So can you briefly uh, re remind that or um, clarify um, as a user? Um, um, maybe I'm just interested in knowing uh, what is the, the energy required, the electric energy uh, required to charge uh, a fleet. Uh, but uh, many of uh, the, the users will actually be interested in uh, understanding better the limitations in the grid. Uh, or uh, like uh, Victor uh, raised the, the question of um, a fleet operator who was let's say, constraints in the grid that he cannot um, affect. Uh, and uh, he will then have uh, limitations on how much uh, charging he can uh, uh, do. So can you briefly uh, re um, explain uh, how the user will integrate the use of the tool into uh, a project or uh, an assessment that he may have on, uh, on the interactions between the electric vehicles and the system? Sure, of course. Uh, of course, this will depend on the user. So for example, let's just to go back again to that example and then give more uh, going back to the pilot project for example a developer's example so in that case if a certain company wants to the test for example the operation of 10 or 100 buses or any different type of uh, electric vehicle in this case the thought process would be first they would need to understand or decide how many vehicles they can actually afford and put into test um, and in their case probably the most important um, aspects that they can get of the tool are two things. One would be the big capacity, which can inform the need for a grid hosting capacity. So this would mean, for example, that with this, they can do a preliminary assessment of whether the location where they are planning to put their depot and the charging infrastructure um, is uh, adequate for the charging power that they will demand, and also, with the weekly profile, they can also assess what's the uh, hourly, uh, expected hourly profile of charging. And with that, for example, they can also see if it's the best based on the local power prices. So these are two aspects in which, uh, for example, uh, this tool could uh, help a, a pilot project uh, developer. If you think of a system planner, for example, a system operator, uh, many times also in collaboration with policymakers and the, the ministries, for example, energy many countries, in those cases, there the question would be, um, how could this impact uh, the power system expansion uh, in terms of the need to upgrade the network infrastructure, for example, transmission, um, or also, of, um, for example, uh, even distribution if it's a lower level case. So in that case, for example, you can create different demand curves uh, based on the expected fleet size for every city, as I discussed before, uh, or even for the whole country, if you want. And then, based on those demand curves, you can input those demand curves 
to your modeling exercise. And by that, you can see um, how much extra capacity is needed, for example, in terms of generation, in terms of uh, grids or, on, on, or other things. Um, and with that, you can use that to inform the, the planning uh, of the power system based on those demand inputs that you can have. Also, that could, uh, in many cases, influence uh, and also try to um, help in, in integrating the planning. Um, some other logic of trying to understand uh, the flexibility and to value the flexibility of the EV charging. So as uh, we, we said before, um, in, the, in the fourth step of the uh, policy manual, it's also important to value the flexibility provided by EVs. So in this case, if you input, for example, to this planning exercise, um, unmanaged demand curve with, for example, a comparison with a, a balanced charging scheme or with the time of use tariffs, then you can also see, oh, maybe these uh, schemes uh, mean less demand for that location. And with that, we could save some money because of not needing to invest as much in more grids or more batteries or stuff like this. So these are this is also, I think, uh, one of the things in, in which uh, this tool could help uh, a stakeholder, which in this case would be a, a policymaker in collaboration with a, a system operator. So those would be two examples of uh, uses you would have for this tool. Since there is no, no other question yet for, <laughs> from the, the audience, I have one for you also. Uh, an additional one, um, which uh, which I received a, a lot of times. So um, there is a lot of talk about uh, the future uh, vehicle to grid. Um, so uh, what uh, what does the tool allow to do uh, if uh, someone wants to assess the, the potential of vehicle to grid in a system? Thank you. So as I was showing here in this tool, uh, because we don't have a complex modeling of the power system, which will need extra work in each particular area or country context. What we have here is an implementation of what we call V1G, which is active unidirectional uh, charging. So as I was saying, what this means is that this charging scheme is aimed at using the power system demand as a reference point to try to allocate the EV charging to whenever that uh, power system demand is its lowest in order to minimize the stress of the system. So with that, uh, as I showed in one of the examples today, um, with the tool, we can actually simulate um, the V1G uh, a charging scheme. And for that, there are several other things that need to be in place. So one, of course, you need to define correctly the fleet size and the fleet characteristics and the behavioral patterns of that fleet. And also for V1G, the reference curve is the demand. So you will need to define the demand um, and as I showed, you can either use the standard demand that we have in the tool, you can modify it with the sliders there, or also you can upload your own CSV file that has your own demand. And based on that, and based on all of the modeling and all of the input data that the tool has, the tool will uh, give you as an output the resulting uh, demand uh, charging patterns with the V1G scheme implemented. It's also important, and I also mentioned in the tool and in the presentation that all of this also needs uh, the participation rates. So it's not only a question of um, having infrastructure, but also how many users are actually available to participate in, the, in, in that. So the tool also allows you to modify that parameter uh, to account for, for example, what happens if there is V1G, but only with a very few select users, or what happens if V1G is rolled out massively and most or all the users have a willingness to participate in that scheme. Thank you, Javier. Um, so I see no other question from the audience. Um, I hope uh, uh, this was uh, instructive and that um, uh, the introduction was uh, satisfying for everyone who participated. Of course, the tool remains available um, online. Um, there is also a manual on the tool itself, uh, which gives more descriptions. Uh, so uh, the feedback is always welcome. Uh, there is a, a contact address also provided in the uh, on the manual. So uh, please feel free to contact us afterwards if you have questions or comments or feedback about the use of the tool. 
I think, uh, Javier, we, we can um, um, slightly conclude this um, um, this webinar. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, and in particular to EBRD and to all the colleagues who participated to the organization. So uh, um, I think uh, we can uh, uh, now close this webinar and thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And just to, as a last reminder, we will upload this recording to our event website. So you can check this. Uh, we hope to have it published, uh, hopefully, by the end of this week. Um, that, that way, you can, we will be able to both check the slides I presented today and also to watch again the video in case you, you would like to check a specific section uh, of our presentation today. So many thanks again. And many thanks, uh, as uh, Jack was saying, to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. PBRDs uh, and also Victor uh, to you and we hope to see you again in some future events. Thank you Javier, thank you Jacques, bye. Bye.